Um, so thank you very much and welcome um, everybody who's all around the world um, here in this uh, lecture. Let me just come and share my screen. Good. Okay. And um, so yes, our presentation is called uh, Engaging Students as Co-Designers of uh, learning analytics and uh, this is work that we've done uh, myself uh, Fabio Campos is also here and uh, alongside um, Alisa, Alisa Weiss, Professor Alisa Weiss um, and uh, hey how's it going <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, we're all part of NYU Learn uh, which is a research network at the heart of NYU's other stakeholders and um, part of what we do is to try to kind of create learning and 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 create all sorts of activities to um, encourage the use of learning analytics uh, in our community and encourage the culture of learning analytics and and uh, and, and good practice in this field um, and we also coordinate services uh, on learning analytics with uh, our IT department this is our team as you can see there's a lot of people um, a lot of them will be presenting and a lot of them are participating in this lab so you might you know be seeing them in um, other rooms uh, we have a few of them here today and, and uh, shout out to uh, Yonji who has a presentation in a couple of days if you want to check uh, more of our work. Um, and also shout out to our partners who have been very, very central in this project. Um, this is a project where we're trying to build a tool, uh, a, a student facing tool um, of learning analytics. And uh, this is a tool that actually we hope to, it will be rolled out um, in reality to the whole of NYU, um, and this wouldn't have been possible with the help of Andrew Brackett and Rob Egan from the NYU IT Learning Analytics Service, um, and also from so many other people from all parts of NYU that have helped, a steering committee from all sorts of faculty and advisors, um, other researchers from LEARN, and a lot of graduate collaborators that have been helping in the design, and of course, the students that participated in the sessions with us. Um, now, on this presentation, we're gonna very briefly talk about kind of like why we chose a participatory framework to design this student facing learning analytics tool um, how we did it what were the challenges and what were some of the ways that we try to deal, deal with these challenges and then we're going to talk about some of the conclusions that came up from uh, doing this in a participatory fashion and, and, and kind of like what our project is up to and what are some of our next uh, steps uh, next upcoming steps and the big question here of course is how and why should we be inviting students into the design and development of the tools that we are creating? Um, so uh, learning analytics is a, is a growing area and um, now it's everywhere in higher education, a particular student facing learning analytics seems to be like a next frontier um, with more calls for self-regulated learning like, like what we saw in the previous um, presentation. But, um, even though the, this is growing, one kind of like interesting and, and, and you know, maybe shocking thing is that a lot of these tools are actually being developed without um, participation and without input from the people who these tools are being developed for. Um, and the truth is, you know, as much as we may be teaching students, as much as we may be working with students, we don't know them. Um, mm. We know some information about them, but the truth is they're more diverse they are, they, their interests are, are different from what we expect, what makes them tick, what makes them, um, you know, work and, 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 in, and interact with technology uh, are lots of, you know, there's a lot of kind of like unknowns uh, in, in, uh, in this area. And, um, and recently, uh, this is just like three years ago, Bodley and Ververt found that only 6% of the studies of student facing learning analytics had a clear and explicit needs analysis. And only 11% uh, reported doing any usability testing whatsoever. Now this means that we are building tools that are based on assumptions, um, either from you know, previous research or uh, just from what we think that we know that students want to need, but not actually from interacting with you know, real students on, on, on real situations in our campuses. Um, and this is brought to like this call for uh, for actually bringing these populations that we design with into the processes that render these designs. Um, now, this is not easy. Uh, as Buckingham Shum Ferguson and Martinez Maldonado wrote in this, uh, uh, in this piece for JLA, uh, they say, you know, involving stakeholders may be perceived as difficult and time consuming and expensive, complicated, et cetera, but involving them can make the difference between an unsuccessful prototype and a system that is taken up successfully. 
And uh, on this very paper, they created this term and that, you know, it's kind of like a big uh, call for our community for HCLA, Human Centered Learning Analytics. Now, uh, these Human Centered Learning Analytics have, have different levels. Uh, we can be designing about um, a group of people. We can, you know, kind of like have an image of, okay, this is the student that we'll be designing for or the type of faculty and kind of like um, keep that image, maybe do a few surveys, you know, and, and design about something. Uh, we can also be designing for a population and maybe um, do user testing and bring them over, have them test the tools and see kind of, you know, what, what adjustments can be made to the tools that we design to make these tools better. But um, kind of like the highest level, the sort of cold standard uh, can be uh, designing with them, actually bringing them into the room where it happens um, and, and, and where the designs are being developed to have this constant process of, you know, uh, of, of bringing their information, working with them, and actually having them have ownership um, of the tools that will eventually be rolled out for them. So how participatory, how, how did, we, um, uh, did we go about this process? So um, first of all, uh, <coughs> when we were um, doing learning analytics uh, in a participatory fashion, of course, this is easier said than done. And we knew there were gonna be challenges along the way. Uh, first of all, when we were designing with students, uh, we assumed that there would be issues of data and design literacy. Um, they're not designers and they don't necessarily know about data. We were working with, uh, we wanted to bring into the room, especially first year students. Um, and, um, and so, you know, there was gonna be a need to upskill them or, or do something about this. Um, secondly, we expect there to be issues of trust and hierarchy. Um, when you are trying to be creative, trust and vulnerability are really important. And, you know, university is all about hierarchy. Uh, as facilitators, we're older. How do, how do we deal with that? Um, and also time constraints. You know, how do we, how do, we do this uh, without you know, abusing the time of the students, without slowing the process too much? Um, now, uh, Fabi will tell us a little bit about the context and how we actually did these workshops. Thank you, JP. So to give you a big picture of the context, uh, it was natural that NYU as a university with 50,000 plus uh, students would create a, a, an IT service for learning analytics. So I take it this often in, in 2016, and then Alyssa Yolav Javier founded LEARN, the Learning Analytics Research Network in 18. Uh, we first collaborated IT service for LA and Learn in 2017 when we started creating the first uh, faculty facing uh, dashboard. And our second step is to develop a student facing tool for this big universe I told you about. Click. Sorry. Okay. So what is the big picture of the, the participatory process? It starts actually much before the workshops we're going to tell you about today. Uh, first, we had to frame the problem. And we did this by creating a steering committee. The committee was uh, mainly composed by LEARN members, uh, JP, Alyssa, and I, plus uh, the, eight, the IT team. But we also uh, invited people from student advisors because they know uh, the struggles students go through and also faculty. So we formed this committee, set some boundaries, and then started doing some stakeholder interviews. So in this phase, we interviewed six student advisors, three faculty members, <clears throat> and uh, 13 students. Then we started our co-design workshop. So we brought a lot from human-centered design methodologies in and uh, we held three five hour long uh, workshops with 10 students, uh, all of them undergrads, one UX designer and two facilitators. Actually, this UX designer, JP is gonna tell you more later about uh, the presence of this uh, professional, but it, it was uh, a big game changer in this process. This is uh, a photograph of one of the workshops and uh, yeah, our great JP designing. Um, and just very quickly, let me go through what we did in a workshop. First, an icebreaker. Of course, we don't know each other, we don't know the students, and we need to like bring everyone to the same page. Then we gave them a mini design thinking lecture because we wanted them to see value and learn from the process, but also understand what design and co-design is. 
Then we talked about personas. During the interviews, we um, developed these personas that represent students. So we developed these personas with students even more. We mapped different forms of data, different possibilities, different gaps in data that the university can uh, make available. We ideated a lot. In the ideation, actually, we also used cards. JP will uh, let you know about these cards. And I see that this now is, is a trend in our community, using cards for design. So I'm actually very happy that we're bringing HCD uh, methodologies to our community. We shortlisted ideas prototyped a lot, iterated, prototyped more. So that's, that was like the basic structure of, the, of each workshop. And what we're doing here today in this practitioner report, we are making design more explicit. Uh, we think that when we make design decisions, design moves more explicit instead of uh, only measuring the results of particular designs. When we do design narratives, we can not only understand the use and understand the effects, but also derive theory uh, from what we did from this process. So this is what we are doing today. Cool. So um, some of the principles that we adopted, we kind of had some, some, some linings for how we designed this whole thing. Um, first of all, uh, we wanted to have like a wide design problem space. I saw a question over here whether we were designing like a dashboard for students uh, or a reflective dashboard. Uh, but truth is, we actually came into the room very openly being like, this is going to be anything that the students kind of like come up with that uses data uh, for themselves. Um, and uh, this is kind of counterintuitive. Usually in, in the traditional design thinking methodology, you actually start by narrowing down the problem. But because our students uh, didn't have uh, literacy in terms of in terms of design, uh, we actually purposefully decided to just kind of make a process where, you know, what the problem was could actually change as as we were as we were designing. Um, secondly, uh, we needed to address power. As we said, there were issues of hierarchy, and um, to do this, uh, we used icebreakers. We used um, uh, conversation. We used kind of like a lot of methodologies to to just try to uh, just make sure that everybody felt that they could be very honest. And if anybody challenged us, for, for example, one student actually started challenging, you know, whether this should be an academic dashboard at all or an academic tool, um, we would actually encourage that in the room. Um, and thirdly, uh, we wanted this to be a safe design space. Um, we wanted students to get something out of the process, to be empowered through the process. And one of the kind of like basic things that we did, uh, as Fabio mentioned before, was actually to uh, do, do this as a learning experience for them where they actually learned about design and kind of got to enact it in something that will eventually uh, be, might be rolled out to the community. So some of the strategies that we used um, to enact these principles, uh, well, first of all, empathy mapping uh, is a traditional uh, methodology within design thinking. Uh, what you do is to try to create a persona that you are designing for, but we did it in a, in a kind of, in, a, in, a, in an interesting way. Um, we, we brought information from the needs and challenges of students from the, from the stakeholder interviews before the design workshop. And then we made these into two kind of like archetypes of kind of students that we were designing for, but we left these archetypes unfinished. And once we brought the students into the room, first we recruited students that were similar to the ones that were, uh, that, that were part of the stakeholder group. Um, many students were, for, for example, first generation students in the university. And, and we asked them to kind of fill out uh, these personas, to, to, to fill them out with their experiences and the experiences of other students that they knew around them. Um, and, and, and try to make them, you know, kind of like as human and as real as possible. Uh, the second thing uh, Fabio mentioned, we use design cards to upskill students to be, uh, to be thinking uh, with and through data. Um, so how do these cards work? So, um, you have, you have cards with different colors, blue and, and, and green, okay? Uh, and uh, essentially the blue cards are verbs, something that this tool could do. Like the tool can know something or can tell you something. The green cards then would have statements that were based on the data that we know was available from students and data that maybe we could, we could get. Like uh, this tool can know, uh, for example, uh, can, can know what day you began to prepare for an assignment and the day that your other classmates started. Or can help you compare what order you did things and what order others followed. And the idea is that they would put these tools just randomly, just like put them together and then think for a second, okay, 
is there is this important does this uh is it can this be useful in some way for the persona that we created and then they would ideate you know kind of quickly ideate ideas uh for uh for how to to use these cards um we use these kind of like first seed of idea so first seed of, seed of an idea to uh to make it into like an actual tool that could then be developed finally um fabio mentioned that we had a ux designer in the room so Students were prototyping, but we also had this UX designer also prototyping. Students would come up with an idea, they would share it with the designer, and he would very, very quickly iterate on kind of like one way in which this idea could, could be made into a tool, um, allowing kind of more rounds of iteration within the same, uh, within the same room. Now, uh, this is kind of like the cool part. These are some of the things that came up from this process. This is one of just like, these are two of many designs that the students produced. So um, in this one, um, a student kind of came up with this kind of combination of cars, something that tells you what were your mistakes. And I don't know if you can see this, but here, here's this first kind of like a writing ideation uh, 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 sheet. Uh, and down here it says, you know, what about a graph that uh, makes you show, shows you the class mistakes? And then he quickly comes to the idea, maybe this can be like a dinosaur. Then on the second round of iteration, uh, we ask them to actually draw the draw the ideas and, and, and flesh them out, and he and he kind of like draws this dinosaur where the scales um, are the different questions that people got wrong, and on the top are the questions that a lot of people got wrong, and on the sides questions that you know others got wrong, and then you would have a six and sort of color signal that shows you the ones that you uh, got wrong within that. Um, then we bring this to the UX designer. He creates another version, and we kind of like try to test some of the assumptions and 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 and, and think more deeply of how this tool would look like and how it would work. Uh, we show this back to the students, they give us feedback, um, and then we created a, a bunch of like different digital uh, prototypes that we then showed to kind of like a month or, or, or two months later uh, to another group of uh, students uh, in UX testing. Fabio um, is going to tell us about this other design. So another product that came from these workshops was uh, what students call the Hive. So first they said, do we really need a dashboard? Do we really need a tool that says, oh, we're doing great, you're not doing great, you will likely fail or will, you will not. So they said, uh, we want something that tells us uh, more than the academics. We, we want to see the effort we need to put in each course and see all of the courses. So they started talking about a hive in which the cells were the courses. And the second thing they said is, oh, we actually want to see where the quote unquote bees are going. So what if we uh, see where other students are, what other students are doing? And the second thing they, they said is, uh, what if we, instead of just talking about academics, we could also talk about our lives? Because in our uh, hive, we have to balance uh, academic life with personal life, with uh, professional life, which is the third element that came later. So the idea of a hive began expanding. So our uh, UX designer with students started going to like more sophisticated prototypes. Uh, and that's the third version. And JP, if you click once again, this is how it's kind of looking right now. You see like each cell is an aspect uh, of life. You can have either academics, professional, personal. When you click in each of the cells, it opens in each of the assignments, uh, but this is like still uh, uh, an undeveloped prototype for both desktop and mobile. And JP will later tell you how this uh, platform is evolving, but this is what we have so far. Thank you very much, Fabio. So uh, very quickly, some of the insights for practice. Uh, first, uh, with the challenges that we had to deal with, um, in terms of trust and hierarchy, uh, we were we feel that we were able to empower students through the mechanisms that we mentioned, uh, you know, uh, icebreakers, conversation, etc. But this this proved very very time consuming. Um, it, it's hard to bring everybody to make them into a team. And even though we had like three five hour sessions, that was actually that actually proved to be not a lot of time. Uh, second, in terms of the lack of time, this had an impact on how how deep and how creative students could be uh, in creativity studies. You actually are assumed that you know the first bunch of ideas that you're going to have are more or less predictable um, and uh, because of time constraints actually we, we couldn't go as deep as we wanted to we couldn't do as many rounds of iteration as we as we expected uh, in terms of data and design literacy um, even though we managed to upskill them to 
to, to come to, you know, ideas that were really cool and interesting. The truth is a lot of the solutions that students came up with were actually not in the field of learning analytics. They were interesting tools that seem useful, but, you know, they were actually not stuff that we could develop as a, as a learning analytics research network. Um, and uh, the, the last point is really interesting. When we were doing the, the empathizing part, uh, you know, creating these personas, actually some of the students, some of the students were very empathetic, but some of them actually had a lot of trouble uh, looking at students with challenges and empathizing with them and would actually kind of like judge them, um, which is exactly what you don't want to do in a, a, when you're creating a, a persona. Um, now, even though there were all these challenges, there's things that, you know, we thought were really cool that came out, out of here. Uh, first of all, we see that students don't just want a dashboard, apparently. Um, they had dashboard elements in their solutions but none of them was just a dashboard. And whenever we kind of, you know, came up with an iteration that was so, so just a dashboard, they would kind of reject it and they would, they would want to do other things with it because they see this data as integrated into, you know, their larger lives and they want to see other things than just a piece of data. Um, secondly, something that came up with in a lot of the solutions, and this is consistent with the literature, students wanted to uh, know what the experts were doing, you know, learn to study how the experts were doing, see the papers that the experts uh, were, you know, looking at. And the experts are students that are doing really well. Um, and that is, you know, interesting. At the same time, we know that there can be certain challenges in comparison in terms of kind of self self image. So this is kind of one of those things that we're, we're kind of fig figuring out how to deal with now in the designs. Um, finally, uh, participant solution used a lot of holistic and emotional and gamified and storified design, which we don't necessarily are doing a lot of in the space of higher education learning analytics. But as you could see, all of their designs seem to have like some element of, of fancy, um, you know, the, the hive with the bees and the dinosaur. Um, and, and I believe that, you know, those elements actually help them process the data in a way that, um, that I don't know, was, was more, more uh, friendly, I guess, than just a, a graph. And they could also, you know, help uh, data literacy issues with, uh, with the populations that we are working with. So what are the next steps in our, in our project? Uh, well, first of all, uh, this is the outline of our, of our big process. Uh, what we're presenting here is the first four uh, squares. We are right now kind of going through the second row um, and the third row is the future. As you can see, this process is not perfectly participatory. Students are involved in some of the phases, but not in all of them. Um, and uh, what we're doing right now is we have been testing some prototypes at the NYU Usability Lab after uh, what we presented here. We are preparing for a minimum viable product and kind of like sketching and, and pre-designing that uh, in order to try to test it sometime this year with, uh, with, with real students. And, uh, and also uh, with the data that we brought from this uh, workshop, um, we are coding it to actually make it into a, a, a full research paper in the future. So thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, feel free to ask us um, any questions. Uh, and um, by the way, uh, if we don't finish the conversation here, uh, I'm going to leave you with this link, uh, the, the one on top uh, to the left. Um, that's like a, a, an informal chat room where we can uh, debrief more after this lecture.